Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for another exciting episode of The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Bedley. And my guest is on the line. My guest this morning is Courtney Carter de Jesus. From being a journalist to currently a communications director and now author, one thing remains the same for Courtney, her love of storytelling and words. Courtney Carter de Jesus previously worked as a television news reporter for many years before becoming a communications director in the world of politics. Courtney received her bachelor's degree from the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University, her master's degree from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, and certification in management from Harvard Business School. Courtney, her husband, and their two children are from New York, but they currently live in Rhode Island. Eva the Kid Reporter is her first children's book. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, Courtney Carter de Jesus. Courtney, good morning. Good morning again. Hey, good morning. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Thank you for joining me this morning and for us rescheduling. Originally, uh, Courtney was going to be with me on the first Saturday in February, but because I had scheduled uh, my surgical procedure the day before, I thought it wise not to try to do anything on that Saturday. And Courtney, I'm glad I did because I wouldn't have been able to move. <laughs> I would not have been able to get up here. So, yes, um, listening audience, let me tell you how this all came about. My former English teacher, also colleague, because we were actually vice principals, and then I was principal, and she was still vice principal, but we were colleagues. But originally, I was her student, and she was my teacher, one of my favorite teachers, because I always loved language arts. And... This particular person was one of my favorite teachers that I had when I was in high school, and that was none other than Miss DiMartino. So I get this package that was sent to me, and um, she was sharing with me how she had purchased some books from a friend of hers, and she sent them to me and said, maybe you can use them for some of your students in your school. And I said, oh, okay, great. So I hit her back up and said, hey, if your friend wrote the book, I want to have her on my show as a guest. So she got in touch with Courtney, and Courtney sent me a package as well with her press kit and some more books and everything else. And lo and behold, we have now made today happen. I don't know if Ms. Martino is listening or not, but Ms. Martino, if you are, good morning to you. Because I know I was on our Facebook sites, and I was tagging her in the various posts. So I hope she saw that and she's tuning in this morning as well. But that's how this all came about. So, Courtney, I tell you what, this is what we do. We go all the way back to the beginning and we work our way up to you now okay. becoming an author. So let's go all the way back to, like, I just read in your bio about the various schools that you went to in terms of majoring in public relations and communication and so forth and so on. Where did that come from? Was that something like as a, as a child that you always had an interest in or you know where did this whole public relations communications interest come from yeah yeah so it was a, a dual degree in uh, broadcast journalism and actually musical theater which is a very unique um degree but Syracuse has a great program uh for musical theater as well so clearly I always loved you know performing I've always loved talking and being in front of others um, and so people think because you like doing that that you're not a shy person or can't be, but you, you can be. You just have a love for it and just push past that. So, um, so yeah, so I always loved writing and words and reading books, and I would spend hours, you know, as a kid, as a teen, uh, reading and reading magazines and collecting them. And, you know, I think I've always wondered how the bug got planted in me because people ask me this all the time. But I think it was a combination of just my natural interest and also my father, um, Dominic Carter. He um, is a TV and radio host, um, has been in the game of journalism for a very long time, and is great at what he does. And so I think maybe seeing his influence, you know, influenced me as well to go into journalism. And so you knew from the start, because this is what I work with kids all the time, and I tell people in general, and not everybody can do this, because as you know, as kids, and you probably ask your kids at some point or will, the same question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And a lot of times, you know, at the young ages or whatever, folks don't know, and that's okay. Um, but what I have found is 
folks who had an idea at an early age and knew, I found them to be super successful. And what I mean by that is they knew exactly the course they needed to chart to get to where they wanted to go. And the examples I always use is the musician Kenny G. Kenny G had no idea what a saxophone was until one day he was watching the Ed Sullivan show and he saw a person playing this instrument and he flat out said, that's what I'm going to do. I want to do that. I don't even know what that instrument is, but I'm going to learn how to play that and do that. And sure enough, that's what Kenny G became. He became a jazz musician. He's toured the world and I've seen Kenny G live a couple of times. Wonderful musician. Bill Clinton, the story is very similar. He met John F. Kennedy when he was 17, 18, 16 years old, somewhere around there. And he said right off the bat, I am going to be president of the United States one day. And the reason I'm sharing both of those stories is they set their course and everything they did was to get them to that goal. Was that kind of like your story, knowing as a young lady, you know what? I mean, was your intent to be on TV or radio or, or, or on stage? Was that was the original intent as a child? Yeah, those two examples are so great. Um, and actually, I didn't know that story about Bill Clinton, and that's really, really fascinating. Um, like you said, I think a lot of kids don't know what they want to do, and I think that is okay, right? Because uh, being younger is, is exploring and learning and also figuring out what you don't want to do, which is also why I encourage kids um, to do internships when they hit those years because it may not be what you want to do, but you're figuring out what you don't want to do, and that's good too. Um, but, I, yes, I think I was one of those children that knew what I always wanted to do. Um, I used to have pictures of people that were on TV, you know, on my walls in my bedroom. I'd have uh, singers up there on my wall and so I knew um, that I always wanted to perform in some capacity. I always wanted to be um, on camera and be informing people or talking to people um, and do that. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do but I knew it was going to be something in, in, in that realm. And so yes, everything I did, um, including doing you know beauty pageants when I was younger, um, I was told I would be helpful in terms of my journalism career on TV. Everything that I did was to chart a course to um, become a television reporter. While you're on the the television reporter part of your career, it's interesting because you're now like, I mean, a very good friend of mine that I went to grad school with. She was a television reporter at some point and then gave that up, and, and ultimately she's now a teacher. She went on and got her doctorate, and she's a teacher, and she wrote for uh, WPIX for years. She, she actually went into the behind the scenes and started writing. But the way I'm going with this question is many people think like being on front, in front of camera and, you know, reporting and things like that being seen on TV all around, you know, the areas where they think that's really glamorous. And yet I see those of you who had done it, in many instances you leave it to go do something else. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that because, again, you're, you're exposed, you're on camera, folks are seeing you, oh, my God, she's beautiful, folks are seeing you every day. But like I said, my friend in grad school, she did the same thing. She, she got out of the, the broadcasting part or the, or the uh, reporter part and, and did other things. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point. You know, people do see anything on TV, you know, or radio, as you know, you know, as glamorous and as really cool, and it can be, right? There are definitely aspects of it that can be. Um, but I think that there's a lot of work that you know, Mark, that goes on behind the scenes. So people may see this one-hour, you know, uh, program or show that you're putting together with me right now, um, but they're not seeing all the behind-the-scenes work that you did to get there, right? And so I think that there's so much behind the scenes work in journalism. Um, um, there's long days, it's very um, they're unstable hours. You know, sometimes I'd be at work at two in the morning, so I would have to go to bed at six o'clock the day before. Um, and so my whole life was, was really work. Um, and so I had a really good time. There were, you get to see a lot of things that the average person doesn't get to see. And um, a lot of events where people are rushing out you are also rushing into those events to cover them. Um, you know, courtrooms, um, you know, there's certain things like tragedies that are really unfortunate that you see, but there are also a lot of good things that you cover as well. But I think that ultimately, you know, now that I have two children, my focus changes. You know, as you get older, your focus changes. And I wanted to spend more of my stable hours being with my children and helping them grow and figure out what they want to do. 
uh, my son right now, he wants to be a YouTuber, which is a totally different uh, career that even existed when I was a kid. <laughs> That's absolutely uh, right. Which totally opens up an, another door that didn't even exist, Mark, right, when we were younger. Um, and so now it's just about, you know, being more of a present mom and helping them um, because journalism has very crazy, uh, crazy hours. Now, when you were doing the, especially the on TV stuff, did you get hit a lot of times whenever you went into a place and someone had seen you on TV and they, they're like, oh my God, that's 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 Courtney Carter, the Yatu. Did, did you run into that much? Yes, you do. It never for me. It never. Uh, you never get used to it. It's very strange because I would, you know, you walk into somewhere and you know someone's staring at you, people are staring at you, and your first thought is. Do I have something on my face? You know, is my is my hair standing up? Like, you know, why are people looking at me? And then it takes a second, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, they they they've been watching you on TV, but I just think automatically, my first thought was like, you know, there's something on my face here. But then, you know, it, it takes a while to to realize, you know, oh, okay, they recognize me. It's a very strange feeling to not be a stranger to people you know it's different when you're going to like you know someone's a family member's house or a friend's house you know everyone but when you go out to a store or a movie and people know you i, I think it takes a while to to get to that level of recognition i'm sure people like beyonce are used to it but you know we're, we're nowhere near that realm so well, maybe they are, maybe they're not, because, uh, again, radio is a little bit different in terms of we're not necessarily seen, we're heard. So folks may or may not know you're in radio. Folks may or may not know I'm in radio. But TV folks see you, so they know if they see you out in the store or what have you, they see you. Because, see, for me, and I, and I know what you're saying, I don't get starstruck. I mean, I've met many celebrities. I've met many athletes, so forth and so on. Politicians, and, and you're in politics, so I'm sure you, you get a chance to meet politicians as well. But for me, I may acknowledge their work. You know, I really appreciate your work, this, that, and the other. But as far as, oh, my God, I'll never wash this hand again. I ship Courtney the Jesus' hand. Like, like, so far as all that kind of stuff, no, I've never gotten into that. Because it's like, they're human beings. And I always say the only difference is their job is seen by more people and they may or may not make more money. So as far as like falling all over the place because they're a quote unquote celebrity, that's never been kind of like my game. But I, you know, I'm not judging folks who do because I understand it. I get it. But um, what, what fascinates me though, just like with my friend Donna, who, as I said, we went to grad school together, was that you all are able to walk away from it because many people can't walk away from the limelight like that. Yeah, that's, you know, what you, you uh, bring up some very, very good questions and interesting points. Um, it is, it is difficult. Um, from, like you just said, when, you know, when you go uh, you're outside and you're used to being recognized, you know, people, um, people know your work and they will talk about a story that you did. It's very nice to have that feeling of people realizing what you do for a living, you know, and going into, um, a concert and someone saying, hey, you know, I really like that story that you did. Or that story really helped me to, you know, go get um, my health checked out. Um, so when you leave that line, like, you're not getting that automatic recognition for your work that you do, um, which is more of what all of us deal with every day. Um, but as someone that, yeah, was in the limelight and now it's taking more of a backseat, it is a very strange um strange feeling to not have people know what you're doing every day. Yeah, I can only imagine it. But at the same time, because I know, again, now do you ever, because I do multiple things and I'm so glad, I'm grateful to God for it, and so I've actually published music and all that kind of stuff, and every now and again I will listen to my actual music and say, wow, I don't even remember playing that. I can't believe that was me. Clearly that was God coming through me or what have you. Do you ever watch yourself on TV and say, that's me? Yeah, because like I was mentioned before, you know, I people think that because you're on TV that you're not um, a shy person or don't have aspects of that personality. And so I think I can be very extroverted, um, but I think me, it's kind of like a character. You know, I, I think of, of, I mentioned Beyonce earlier because I'm a big fan of hers. She had that character, Sasha Fierce. Do you know about Sasha Fierce? No, I'm not familiar with it, but that, that doesn't <laughs> surprise me. Yeah, well, that's new to you, right? So... When she had um, her album, she made two albums at one point, at one time. One was called I Am Beyonce, one was called I Am Sasha Fierce. And so she told people that <laughs> Sasha Fierce was like her character that she went into when she was on stage because she's a naturally shy person. 
Um, and so I kind of felt like that. I felt like I would watch myself back on screen later, and I'd be like, who is that person? Because right. you kind of just have to just go. You, it's your job, so you have to do it, especially when you're live. Being live is an experience like no other. I don't think most people will ever know what it's like to be live, you know, on air like you do, Mark. Um, or like I've done in the past because you can't really mess up. You just Correct. <laughs> you can't, you have to keep up. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> you, know it, you know it, that can be like it's a very nerve-wracking experience sometimes. Let's say you just forget what you were going to say or you just blank out. Like I've, I've had times where I've completed the whole story and then I blanked out on what city I was in because, you know, every we move around so much. Right. Uh, and news, I'm like, what city am I in? Like, <laughs> you know, things like that, and people are just like, I'm like, oh my gosh, people are going to see this. And so, you know, you, you have to kind of um, be a more confident version of yourself. So I don't want to say a character, you know, but it's more of like putting on this confident mask on yourself to get out there and do it. And then sometimes you'll play things back, like you say, your music, and you'll be like, who is this person, you know? Um, so you kind of put on your game face and you just hope for the best. That's absolutely right. I mean, I've done the same thing, when, even when I've gone back and listened to the recordings of the show. I was like, wow, that was my voice? Wow. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, wow, you know, it, it's it, you really do. And, and so that's why I'm kind of going down that line. Now, in terms of, because, again, folks always associate, you know, TV, movies, radio, music, whatever, has like this glamorous feel to get into. How do you, because I know the music business is cutthroat, and matter of fact, the media industry, movie, all of that industry is cutthroat. How do you like break in? How do you get hired as a reporter? How do you wind up being on air? For somebody in the listening audience that might be saying, I'd love to do that, but I have no idea of how to get that done. I mean, I can remember years ago, this is going back way, way before you were even born, I did the Cannes Film Festival, and I was doing a promotion, because at the time I was working for AT&T, and I was in their marketing department, and I was doing a promotion for our particular product at the time, it was called USA Direct, and I mean, it's like, if you weren't in the movie business, they didn't even talk to you. As soon as a couple of words came out your mouth, if it wasn't something movie related, they kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've definitely been around people like that. I understand. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, how do you, like, because you went to some heavyweight schools here. We're looking at Syracuse, CUNY, and Harvard. You went to some heavyweight schools here. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes, too. But how did you crack the code to actually wind up getting on air? You know, um, I think, honestly, I think nowadays it's easier than ever, and I'll explain that. Um, when I was in school, that was a long, the years go so fast, Mark. When I was in school, um, almost, you know, 13, 14 years ago, um, I think it was harder because you didn't have these devices that we now have in our hands, right, that we're all holding. Correct. These iPhones and these Androids have more technology than what I had starting out with at school. Correct. You know, in terms of the equipment and stuff like that. And so I think if somebody wants to get into the industry, the media or entertainment industry nowadays, it's easier than ever because you have a phone. And I say that to say that, you know, you can go on social media and you can make your own news channel on TikTok. Correct. You can make your own news channel on Instagram, on Twitter. I know I follow people that, you know, tell me local news, tell me national news, and they're very passionate about it. Um, and, you know, that's, a great starting point. You can make your whole career from your hobby online. So I would say there's someone that's listening that wants to go into this business now, you know, take your phone, film yourself um, doing a, a broadcast at home, film yourself um, doing some news outside or doing a start a podcast, whatever you'd like to do, the tools are literally in your hands. Um, and so I would say for myself, when I started out, um, you know, 12, 12 to 13 years ago, um, it was harder because, you know, we had phones, but they weren't anything like this. Correct. When I started school, <laughs> this is dating myself. When I started school, Facebook had just came out that year. And we <laughs> thought it was a very incredible year of life. <laughs> I know, I sound like a dinosaur. Not at all. I'm laughing because you think you're a dinosaur, then I don't even, well, I don't know what's before dinosaurs. Then, <laughs> because I can remember when PCs and all of that was just introduced, when, Matter of fact, before Facebook was this uh, MySpace, 
And, uh, you know, I, I remember, well, you, me, I think me and your dad are somewhere around the same category. He might be a little bit younger than me, but we go all the way back to 45s and 33s and a half records. So. Yeah, I think he's around the same age as you. And so, yeah, but I, I do, it feels like there's a totally different life. It is. Facebook after Facebook. It just totally busts open, it changed the world, right? And so to be, to start college that year, which I'll just tell you the year of 05, because you can just look it up. Um, to start college that year was a very, very um, interesting, game-changing moment. Um, and so I think um, people that have those tools after, um, they're, they're, they're great. Start your own stuff now, and it can totally take off. Um, start your own YouTube channel. That's your news right there. <laughs> you know, and a exactly. lot of us get, get our information from YouTube. I'm on YouTube all the time, just watching videos, learning. And I just get stuck on it. I'll go from video to video. And two hours later, I'm like, why am I still watching this, you know? Um, but it has really fascinating stuff. And so if I would start your own YouTube news channel or, or music channel. Um, I think Justin Bieber got discovered via YouTube. A lot, right. of, a lot of people did. Um, but, yeah, so it, it was a lot harder for me. You had to go, um, you know, outside with these big, big cameras. They didn't even make the small cameras yet. And they probably weighed, you know, half your body weight and these huge tripods. And I had to go around in the snow, so I went to school in Syracuse, and just lug it around and, you know, ask people if I can talk to them, if I can meet with them. Um, fast forward to when I left journalism, a lot of people were shooting their videos on their iPhones. Correct. Now, again, I was acknowledging the fact that you went to some heavyweight schools. And since yeah. this is February and is African American or Black History Month, as you were going through these programs, were there many Hispanic or African American folks going through, or were there? There might have been, I don't know. Uh, but what, were there, or were you one of the few? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I, um, there were not. Um, I feel like the world has changed so much, even in the last decade. It's, um, the emphasis on diversity is so much more important um, nowadays than it was, um, uh, you know, 13, 14 years ago, uh, which is a great thing. Um, but when I was going to school um, at Syracuse, I was one of the few minorities. Not even just, you know, black people, it was black, it's minority, period. Um, I had a lot of classrooms where I was the only in the room. I'm sure, Mark, you've had that experience. Oh, yes. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. It's a very um, interesting experience when you are the only person of color in a room because a lot of times people will project um, their opinion onto you when you become the voice for all people of color. Correct. And that's not fair, right? You Correct. Know, we're not a monolith. So... Um, so yeah, I've definitely sat in classrooms where, you know, professors have asked me questions or looked in my direction, you know, and to be the voice of minority issues that I'm like, Let, I don't speak for all, you know, for all minority groups. Correct. You know, yeah, having to stand your own ground um, in a room full of people who don't look like you is a very, um, give me a challenging experience, but it also makes you very strong, as, as you know, Mark. That is correct. I, I, I mean, you, you've said it very well. And the reason I keep emphasizing the schools, because in many instances in these schools, sadly, and it has changed, it has gotten for the better, but a lot of times you won't see a lot of African-American folks there. And as if, like, I see Harvard there. I did some coursework up there at Harvard, loved it. As a matter of fact, the dean of the education program, of graduate school of education up there, actually she was African-American. Um, and so, but, and I was there and I wasn't there to do a whole lot of coursework, coursework, but the time that I was there, I was like, you know what, I could have done this. I could do this. I could do Harvard. There's no question I could do Harvard, but it's just that you don't see many. It's not a whole lot, but certainly more can, can. And so when I see CUNY, when I see Syracuse, when I see Harvard, I'm like, yes, because there's no reason for us not to be there. So when I come across someone who has, yeah, I'm going to acknowledge that, and I'm going to, you know, say let's talk about that a little bit because I want to encourage more to do it. So how did you select those schools? <laughs> uh, well, I literally put um, looked up top journalism schools in the country. Um, you know, journalism, like you said, was one of my goals was, uh, when I was young. It was just that, that target that I had. So like Bill Clinton and JFK, it was kind of like, okay, how do I get there? How do I become this? Um, and so I started looking up the best schools in the country for journalism, and Syracuse kept topping the list. 
Um, and so I said, okay, well, I started looking up the alumni. I said, okay, if I want to do journalism and I want to have a great network, because that was something that I learned later in life, which I should have learned sooner on my own, is that your network is so important. Correct. Who you surround yourself with is very important. And so I said, okay, if I want to um, do this, I need to be at, at a school that can help this happen. And you don't know how many times I've walked into an interview or into a story and someone's like, oh, I also went to Syracuse. Oh, I'm also an, an alum. And that helps. It, it helps a lot. And so I think, um, yeah, just looking up the best schools in the country, Syracuse kept popping the list, and I was like, I set my sights on it, and I was like, I need to go there. And see, you proved the point that I was making earlier in terms of, and, I, and again, I'm not saying every child has to know definitively what he or she wants to be. However, what I am saying is, the sooner that you do have an idea or really feel like this is the way I'm going, the more you can do things exactly what you just described. I knew I wanted to go into journalism, so therefore I'm going to start looking up the best journalism schools. I knew I had to come up with folks who are in journalism, so I'm going to start networking them. So, because this is the other thing, and again, I, I got a feeling I'm, I'm probably older than your dad, or he might be a couple years younger, this, that, and the other, but he can probably attest to this whole thing. We were around before search engines on the computer. Mm -hmm. Our ability to get in touch with somebody is what they now call today snail mail. <laughs> we would have to write a letter to someone. And I can remember as a child, you know, particularly like if you, like I've been a Pittsburgh Steeler fan since I was 12. I've been a Yankee fan since I was 12. So you write a letter off to your favorite player or whatever, never heard anything back. <laughs> the letter is probably somewhere in the stadium, buried under the stadium or in the garbage or whatever. Mm -hmm. But with search engines, with this thing we call Google, if you reach out to someone who's in that field and you let them know, hey, I'm a, and this is what I tell my students at school all the time, hey, I'm a student, I'm looking forward, or I, what my interest is is to do what you do one day. Are there any words of advice or anything you can have? Courtney, there's very few people that if they get a let, uh, an, an email or, or something on their inbox or Twitter or Instagram or whatever from a child or a student that they won't respond back. I mean, I have had folks, even whenever I'm reaching out to get folks to be visitors or, I mean, guests on the show, I, I have reached out to them and I've had, I mean, I've had some big names on here and just from going through the various social media channels. My point is they respond. So when you start saying, I knew I wanted to go into journalism, I had to build a network, I'm looking for the best schools, you set your course, you set your sights and was able to do that. And technology, they weren't, it's not where it is now, but it, at least it was in existence. For me and your dad, it wasn't even in existence. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. that is so important, what you just said. And I hope parents, if you're listening, or children, if you're listening, if you listen to what Courtney just said, I researched the best schools in the field that I wanted to go in. Yep, and I think your point of the mail, and I was going to bring that up too, is so important. Like I was saying, now it's easier than ever, right? Like you can send uh, a DM to somebody and, and ask for their advice or ask for their, their mentorship or, or ask for a cup of coffee. But when I um, started out, I was rejected so many times. I, was, I had just put my work on DVDs, um, which I don't even, I mean, they still make DVDs, but people don't really, really use them. Correct. Um, I had put my work on about 100 DVDs. Me and my dad sent them to about every station in the country when I first graduated. And I pretty much heard back from, like, five. And, like, 100, you know, like, so, it was so so much work to make a hundred DVDs. I don't even know if younger people would know what the work would be involved in that. Correct. How long it would take to, you know, upload a video to your computer, write it to a DVD, like copy it over, and it would take forever to transfer. It wasn't like a, you know, one minute transfer. It was like a real time transfer. So it was about 10 to 13 minutes for each DVD at times that by a hundred. And that's looking up the mailing addresses for these stations, looking up the news directors so you're addressing it to the right person, and then going down to the post office and mailing off these 100 different DVDs. And I I would say if you want to be in this industry, it is cutthroat. You have to deal with a lot of rejection. It's not all success. You know, and that was my first big lesson was that, okay, I'm going to send out these 100 DVDs, and 
of course I'm going to get some feedback because you're thinking about the amount of numbers you're putting out there, right? Like if I'm putting out Correct. 100 tapes, I'm going to get some something back. No, Mark. <laughs> when I first got my tape, I probably really got about five, five um, letters back because it was still snail mail um, uh, versus email. About five letters back and maybe like two or three were just people being kind, responding back. You know, saying, I got your tape. Thank you so much. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> now you can just send somebody like a YouTube link, you know? To your that is correct. And, and put it in an email. And no, I spent about a week a week with my father putting together my resume tape because you need one of those. If you're gonna That's correct. And, you know, on radio, you have like a demo. Okay? Correct. And I sent out so many, Mark, and I, I heard basically crickets back. And that was my first, my first big lesson in, in rejection. And you have to be, like, you have to know who you are because it will hurt, you know. It, it hurts anyone to, to face rejection, you know. But you have to remember the biggest names in the world were rejected. That is correct. And I'm so glad you're going down that road because I was going to ask you, and for those in the listening audience, if you are intending or if that is your intent to break into any one of those fields, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's music, whether it's acting, whether it's dance, whether it's anything, you are going to have to have some thick skin in terms of what Courtney just said about being rejected. And, and because it's going to have authors, I've had authors over the show, over the years, excuse me, that told about, and this again was before self-publishing, about, you know, they send all their work to the big publishing houses, and just like you just explained or described, had that same experience as an author. So you really do have to have a thick skin in terms of just knowing in these various fields, rejection is going to be a part of it, but when you finally do hit, then, you know, you, you're on your way. But... The getting to that point of when you hit, yeah, you are going to hit some rejections. And it was interesting you talking about the DVDs. Yes, I remember that as well. Now, in, um, in terms of, like, your dad being in the industry, because, I mean, I don't know if he's listening this morning or not, but I got a little self-conscious. I was like, oh, man, if her dad is, he's in the business, I don't know if he's going to be critiquing me or what <laughs> as, as he's listening. But uh, how much influence or, because I know he had to be of some great assistance because he's in the field. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Talk a little bit yeah. about that. So, you know, not to make you nervous or anything, but yes, he is listening, of course, because he, he <laughs> likes to critique more, more me, not even you. I'm sure. <laughs> he likes to hear and critique because, you know, he's, he's an expert in his field, you know. Um, he's been doing this for, oh my goodness, maybe like 30 years, TV and radio. Um, and so, yeah, he was a, a great help. It's not every day that you have somebody in your um, your family, you know, that that knows that unique experience of being, you know, on TV, on radio, and can can help you. Um, but funny enough, when I was younger, and my, my dad will probably laugh at this too, I didn't want his help, which was a big mistake. <laughs> um, when, I, when I was younger, I was like, I got this, you know, I want to do my own thing, like, you're old school, just, you know, just, just let me do my own thing. And he was like, okay, he was like, I'll, you know, you <laughs> he, knew, he knew, he knew, of course, you know, the, the older you get, the wiser you get, but, you know, I'm right. just cool thinking that I know everything, and... He's like, all right, well, you circle back and let me know if you change your mind. I'm like, okay, I, I won't. I got this. And them DVDs hit me in the face hard, baby, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll be on L.A. TV or New York TV in the, in the second. It'll be okay because they'll realize my pride, you know. They'll realize my passion. They'll see the passion through the screen. That they did not. <laughs> so... You know, nowadays, uh, the, last, the last, you know, I would say couple, five, six years, oh, oh yeah, I, I take his advice on everything. Um, you know, silly me, but, you know, when you're young and you're out of school, you think you're grown, you know? And, um, you know, I, that's what I'm going to say. Take the advice of people that have come before you. That's one thing I would tell you um, to anyone that's listening and, and that just, not even just younger, because you may want to change the feel right. like you're older, right? You know, you get some like, different. Your friend that was a journalist that became a teacher, you know, you you don't have to stay in one thing just because you, just because you did it when you were younger. 
That is correct. I'm glad this is radio, not TV, because I have the mic button off, and, and you have me rolling over here. I mean, I'm sitting here in tears listening to you, like, say, oh, no, no, I don't need your help. Like, okay. <laughs> I'm sure your dad was like, all right, okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'll let you that door open if you change your mind. Because he knew, you know, he knew that I was going to, I don't think he knew that I was going to, you know, uh, fall on my face or anything like that, because he knew that I was a very determined individual. He, just mm -hmm. knew, how he knew the business. How cold the business and how cold the world can be. Uh huh. You know? uh, it's, a, it's a cutthroat uh, business. And, and I, I easily thought that they'll just recognize my passion and every door will open for me because they'll see how, how hungry I am. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're laughing because you probably have the same feeling. Well, it's, it's just to hear you describe it is hilarious because I think anyone, and especially in the beginning, they just know they are all that in the bag of chips. What? <laughs> you're not going to accept me and then like you said when the rejections start coming out like you said the little nice letters then you start realizing oh okay all right but but it, it is comical the way you're you're describing it so listening audience i you know i always say this my i'm on the air from six to nine every saturday morning so i, I hope you've been with me since six but no doubt i hope you've been with me since seven because my guest this morning is courtney carter de jesus and we're talking we're working our way up to her now transitioning or shall i say adding on because she's like a renaissance woman because she just said you know you're not stuck in doing one thing so she actually moved away or transitioned from being on air like broadcast journalist to like now she's communications director and where we're going since this is the reading circle is how she became an author so that's what we've been doing. We've been kind of like laying the groundwork over the last half hour or so of her career and how she kind of got where she is, her schooling, so forth and so on. So we're going to move a little bit now in terms of, now you're communications director, and if I remember, it wasn't politics, correct? Yes, yes. Um, and so I'm working for um, the Treasury here where, where I live locally. Um, and I think, you know, I, I tried to figure out the common theme. Like I said, you're not stuck doing something just because you've done it. Don't stay in a career for 30 years, just because it's all you know. You know, a lot of people have done really well in their second act in, in life. And so um, I started to realize when I wanted to move on, I said, you know, what do I love? What am I good at? Um, and I realized the common theme was, was work. You know, it was writing, it was storytelling. And so I said, okay, let me take those um, skills that I have and that I've polished and bring them into my next job. And so I had a strong interest in politics, just from doing political stories um, at work. And my father was also a political anchor and reporter, so obviously it was a huge influence on my, my life. I grew up going to political conventions and political events, and it was super fun to me and super interesting. And so I said, I'm gonna make a career of this as my second go. And so when the position, um, you know, opened up for me, it came into my life, I happily accepted. Um, and so, yeah, I do communications um, in, in politics right now, and, and I love it. Um, I think it takes all the skills I've learned in journalism, and I can apply them to, to what I'm doing now. It's a very interesting world going from being, um, you know, on TV to now being around a bunch of politicians all the time. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So I would say that no matter what I do, I want it to be passionate about it, and I'm, I'm so passionate about what I'm doing. So I know that's right. You brought up so many good points, especially about generally, because I can relate to you because I'm the same way in terms of if you look at everything I've ever done, it, the, the general theme is communication and education. That's mm -hmm. generally just about everything I do is either communicating or educating. And, and yep. usually, you know, it's a combination of both. Um, this is my, let me say, this show started 2001, June of 2001. Wow. So June of 2000, this year of 2023, that would be 22 years on the air. And in that time, you know, this is kind of like my weekend gig. So it's like during my regular week, my day job, as they call it, is being a school principal. And I've had the opportunity, I've been a principal now since 2005. Prior to that, I had, you know, time... Uh, in corporate America. That's whenever I was trying, I was with AT&T. So to your point of not having to be locked in to do any one thing, it's true. Now, for those, I'm not judging, I'm not mad at those that can do the 50 years at one company. That just wasn't mm -hmm. me. You know, the 50 years in one field, that just wasn't me. However, as you just said, 
in terms of uh, thematic, if you will, or either everything kind of relating, yes, I, I, I can understand exactly what you're talking about, even as we move to uh, now being an author, because this is where we come into play. This is how we met. Matter of fact, since you met with, since I met you through one of my favorite mm -hmm. teachers, I want to talk a little bit about how, how we're and we talked about this on the phone prior to, but how did you and Marilyn DiMartino come across each other? Yeah, well, that's actually another um, another segue to your network I was talking about. And so I um, I met her through my family. Um, and so, you know, just being open to, to network, I'm, I'm telling you, most of my opportunities have come from just people that I made the time to get to know, which is, which is amazing. I'm sorry, my voice is, like, cracking this morning right now. See, the problems of dealing with being a communicator, you're always talking. So, oh, know, yes. That's correct. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, always, I'm always talking, so I actually have this uh, growth spray that I got on Amazon up, up so much. Um, but anyway, it's called Magic Brand. You guys want it. I'm Margaret Jansen. Yeah, you'll have to text that to me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, so I think, I think it's, uh, it's working good now. But anyway, so I met Marilyn through, um, yeah, my family. And she picked up a copy of the book, a couple copies actually. She was great. She loved it. And she gave gave one to you. Um, so I think it's just, it, again, it's the power of putting yourself out there, the power of meeting people. And, um, and that's how I met Marilyn, who's wonderful. Yeah. No, she's, I've known her since the 70s, since I was a high school student. I think I had her two or three times throughout my four years, because that was my, for the most part, my major in high school. My, you might as well say it was music and English. And so I took creative writing, I took world lit, I took, no matter of fact, if Marilyn's listening, she knows, uh, Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And, and so in terms of, you know, I remember all of that. And then ultimately, whenever I, I moved out of corporate and into education and then moved into administration, we wanted to be in colleagues. And, and to this day, I still didn't call her Marilyn. I still always called her Miss DiMartino. So whenever she sent me the note with the books, I was like, oh, this is great. As a matter of fact, I had a student, his birthday was, today is Saturday, his birthday was Thursday. So I actually gave him a copy of the book for his birthday. Oh, he turned crazy. he turned nine. He, he went from eight years old to nine years old, so I gave him a copy of your book. And while we're talking about the book, what now or how did you decide that, you know what, I feel like I want to write. I want to you know, I, I got your love for words, and I heard you say earlier you were a reader as a, as a child, as a youngster. So where did the, the ideal and the children's book and where did this whole notion come from? So I think, um, it's, it's like everybody else, um, COVID impacted everybody. And so I think um, for me, I was home during COVID with my, with my son, who's now turning 10, uh, next month, so you just mentioned you know, the gift you gave reminded me of my son, um, so it made me smile. Um, so I was home with him, and I was still reporting the news, but reporting it from my dining room table, which is something that I never thought that I would do. Um, the world just flipped upside down. And so me and my son spent a lot of time reading children's books, um, because as you know, there wasn't much to do besides, you know, work. And right. All the work. And uh, my son was going to school, and I pretty much became his teacher. And so I wanted to make sure that he didn't lose um, all that learning, you know, that was going on. And reading has always been something that I love to do with him anyway. And so I picked up a bunch of children's books um, to make sure we were still reading. He was taking in, in uh, knowledge. And it just kind of clicked to me that, you know, I've always been interested in books. And I said, you know, why don't you write one? You know, why don't you write one of these children's books that you use um, to connect with your son? I read to him every night, um, and there are ways for us to connect and bond. And there's some children's books that were read to me that I'll never forget. You know, um, a lot of people, their favorite children's books, they stick with them, you know, through life. And so it just kind of has a aha moment, as Oprah says, and said, you know, why don't I just I write one and see how it goes? And so that's where the idea came from, being at home during COVID and, and reading a lot of children's books. So the title of the book is Eva, the Kid Reporter. <laughs> now, there's a lot going on here beyond just the fact that this is a children's book. Yes, a lot of, a lot of knowledge and things I try to drop in there. Yep. Just the fact that you have an African-American young lady on the cover. 
Because one of the things we hear in education, and, and it's a big fight around the country now with various politicians of this whole notion of teaching black history, so forth and so on. But one of the clarion cries have always been, we don't have content that reflect our students. Mm -hmm. That most of your content or too much of the content is telling the so-called dominant story. So when I see a book like this for children, especially when you start getting into urban areas or you get into schools that are predominantly Hispanic and black or people of color, if you will, this is critical for them to see somebody on the cover who looks like them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. And so actually this girl, Eva, was inspired by my daughter. Um, my daughter is uh, two years old. She just turned two last week. And she's um, funky, but she's kind, but she's as outspoken as a two-year-old can be, you know, for the limited grasp of language. <laughs> and I just saw, I saw myself in her and started to become this um, this character that represented um, for women of color to me, girls of color. Um, and so when I started to think about the children's book, I said, why don't I use it um, as her as my inspiration for the next generation of black and brown girls that, are, that have these dreams, you know, that have um, voices that want to be heard. And so she became the just the, the character that I put all that into. But like you said, Mark, you know, she's a representation of all the different black and brown girls that are, you know, little out there that have these big dreams. Like, I had them, you well, know. As you, them. because this is her on the cover, but as you open the book, you see an entire African-American family sitting at the table. <laughs> yes, 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 yep. And... That's important. Like I said, Mark, I didn't see myself in children's books when I was a kid. Um, people don't realize how important it is to have representation until they're until they see it and they're like, "Wow, this is this is big." You know, there weren't a lot of dolls that were in different shapes when I was younger. There weren't a lot of children's books in different shapes when I was younger. There weren't a lot of girls in magazines that looked like me when I was younger, and that all makes a difference. No, it's the entire book, what it's doing, whether you realize or not, which it sounds like you did, but you're actually debunking a lot of stereotypes. As someone, it's a kid's, it's a children's book, but the illustrations and the coloring and the characters who are in the, bu in the book are debunking a lot of stereotypes. You actually have a father in here. You have a mother, yeah. father, son, daughter. You have an intact person or people of color family. So mm -hmm. you're, you're, that's, that's some myth. I see an African-American teacher. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was important for me to include. Yep. Yep. And I'm so glad that you noticed all those details. Um, it takes so much work to put out a book. You know, um, people don't realize it. You know, they may see a children's book and say, okay, it's 20 pages or whatever, you know, and with a few sentences on each page. But there's so much thought that goes into to that because that book is going to shape young minds. Right? That is correct. And like you said, the images, image is very powerful. Rather it's on TV and movies, um, in books, it's very powerful. And so everything means something, especially when it comes to minority representation, as you know, Mark. Um, and so those things were, were really thought of, about. So it's really good. And I'm very, very happy that you noticed all those details. I'm pick, you know why? Because I have a, a radar or I'm very sensitive to these issues um, because uh, I do a lot of work. In terms, matter of fact, my particular school that I lead, it was set aside specifically almost kind of like an experiment seven or eight years ago because this, the entire school is extremely small. Uh, it's only boys, and for the most part, because of where we are, it's predominantly African-American and Hispanic. And, and the, the percentages switch over, you know, because we're so small on any given year, I might have higher percentages of Hispanic boys or back to a higher percentage of African-American boys. However, we're constantly exposing them to material and information uh, that looks like them. That's why I was so happy. As a matter of fact, when you walk in my door, there's two display cases. I'm going to add your book to it. 
now that we've had the interview. I have two display cases, and in those display cases are nothing but books that reflect either Hispanic or African American. And so I'm going to add, when I go back, we're on winter break this coming week, but when I go back on the following Monday, I'm going to add this book into my display case so that when folks come in, they'll have an opportunity to see that along with the rest of them. But it's critical. I'm also into messaging that's not, as much as I love words, because I am a wordsmith, I agree, I'm like you, but I'm also into what messages images send. So there was a lot of thought that was put into this. You have a young lady who's looking at herself in the mirror. All right. Yeah. I'm the cover. So she's looking, and then she, as she go, as we go through the book, she sees herself in her teacher. And now she's on. She's watching a reporter on TV that says, "Mommy, I want to be on TV." So again, just like you, she's setting her sights early on. And I also notice here that you have her in various places. You even have her. Looks like what's in the studio. Looks like I see the board on there. <laughs> uh, with the technician in there, you are the she's in. I see. I see all of that. So it's very well put together and uh, but the young man that i gave the book to i'm going to catch up with him when we come back and see if he read it over the break um, or at least looked at it but i i need the boys and like he's like all right, this is all boys school but this is a book about a girl i still need them because we do a lot of work on the boys respecting our queens so this fits right in line with a lot of the messaging that we do with them in terms of females as well. And again, going back to what we were talking about, you already are now setting the tone in the book of the young ladies saying what she wants to be. Just like I asked you the question earlier about CUNY, Syracuse, and Harvard. So, you know, we, we, we talked about how as you go through these various programs, in many instances, you know, we're the one or two people sitting in there who have some color and some melanin in our skin. Um, so even when you have a book like this, you know, you may encourage or inspire a child to aspire. And you're like, you know what, that is, you know, I never thought of it. Because this is the other thing too, Courtney. There are so many careers out there. I mean, the, the occupational b book is like probably close to my height, probably close to five times. I mean, it is, a, I'm, I'm being facetious, but it is an extremely yeah. thick book. Yet most of the time, especially since I'm in a boys' school, the only thing I hear is they want to be in the NFL and the NBA. I was like, do you understand how many more careers there are out there? Matter of fact, had I thought about it in high school, I probably would have gone down the reporter journalism piece as well. Didn't even cross my mind. <laughs> Didn't yeah. even. I think because I think I'm thinking about everything that you said, and there's such heavy information in here. Um, it's a heavy topic. I think it's because they don't see it. Like, Right. All of the Correct. that they're shown is, okay, if you are a, a boy of color, a young boy of color, you can only aspire to be in the NFL or the NBA because that's, that's all they see, right? And so I think that it's so important, like I said, these children's books, people see it as like 20 pages and a few sentences, but it's very important to set the scene because what you take in as a, as a child determines where you go as a teen and as an adult. Um, everything in our kid years, I think, are so important to our to our growth. Um, and so, if a kid, a uh, young boy, sees that he can be a doctor, or someone that looks like him is a doctor um, in a book, then it's going to expand his mind to say, I can do that too, or can be a banker, or a teacher, or you know, even in the education field, Mark, you know, like you're in, there are not a lot of um, men of color. And, and Correct. And how how significant would it be if we had a new generation of men of color going into the education field? That's correct. I mean, and we're constantly, first off, I can't even go down that road because we're in a teacher <laughs> shortage, period. But then when you start slicing it and dicing it and cutting it, trying to say, I want African American, yeah, it gets even slimmer. So you're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons why I love the assignment, because this is my fourth year there. That's one of the reasons why I love this assignment in some respects, even more so than some of my others, because they actually have someone living and breathing who looks like them who is doing it. And um, so they can, they can honestly and say, well, my principal looked like me. I look like my principal, and he's telling me I can do this.
So I, I have no problem. Any of you all want to be reporters or this, that, and the other, you can do it. You, you can do it. And back to the networking thing, again, if one of the boys were to reach out to you and say, you know what, Mr. Medley, come in, I am quite sure you would respond back to them. I mean, like, so they have access to people nowadays that, again, in years past that we didn't have, or at least we had access to them, but they probably just didn't get snail mail. They probably didn't. Uh, but they okay. usually, they do get tweets and Instagram and TikToks and Facebook posts. They do get that. I mean, I, like I said, I've really, in some respects, almost gotten surprised myself when uh, some of these bigger name celebrities actually hit me back up. Like, oh, they actually responded. And I guess because I come at them saying, well, you know, I'm a radio talk show host, this, that, and the other, that, that gives me a little bit of clout, but... Not a whole lot, <laughs> but but they do respond, and so I I take my heart because it is a job well done. It is not a half tail job. It is not a you know a mediocre job. This is an excellent presentation in terms of the storyline, in terms of the graphics, the illustrations, the subliminal messages that we just talked about that are in there. So uh, I take my hat off you. I'm so glad that uh, Marilyn DiMartino introduced you to me, and uh, we've come down pretty much to the end of our time. And what I do at the end of the interview is I give you an opportunity to promote as much as you would like, shout out anybody you would like. The only thing, as you probably know in media, that you can't do is mention a dollar amount. But anything short of pricing or dollar amount, because folks can work that out with you when they get in touch with you. But anything short of that, I'm going to shut my mic button off, and it's yours for the next three or four minutes or so. Awesome. So I would say that I thank you so much for having me on here. So I'm going to shout you out for, for reaching out to your network like you talked about and having me on here. Um, and so if you're interested in getting the book, Eva the Kid Reporter, if you want a signed copy, you can head to evathekidreporter.com, and I will get that um, message, and I'll, and I'll send it out to you. Um, but you can also find it in uh, major retailers. It's available on Amazon. It's available um, at Target and at Walmart. Um, but, again, if you want a signed copy, go to evathekidreporter.com. Um, I want to shout out to my family and friends who are always very supportive of me and everything that I do. Um, and if you have any um want to reach out to me um, for any information, any questions, you can email me, um, court, uh, C-O-U-R-T, Jesus, D-E, Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, at gmail.com. And I'm also on a social media platform that's Courtney Carter, Jesus, so just uh, reach out to me if you have any questions or any advice or just want to network. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, Courtney. Like I said, I was a little self-conscious knowing that your dad might be listening, but a uh, shout-out to him as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and thank you so much. It's been a fantastic interview. I've had a wonderful time chatting with you. I love the book. I'll be pushing the book in the school as well. And, uh, again, I keep on, as you know, my mom always can say, keep on keeping on. I'm going to tell you the same thing she always say, keep on keeping on, yeah. uh, because we need that uh, to constantly be here. You know, I know we're in Black History Month, but Black History Month is every month. I, I get it. I love the fact that we acknowledge it and we pause. And next month coming up in March is Women's History Month, so this will fit with that. Uh, you know, so, you know, we pause those, but, but we also know it's 365 days of the year. And those of us who do have platforms, we need to use them to our advantage. And so you have a platform and you're doing just that. So I take my hat off to you. Have a wonderfully blessed week and weekend, and I will be in touch. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for having me on. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.